same so you're born on the same day, the same year, same, day, same month. Same All right. Month, same year, same wow, year. small world, isn't it? <laughs> we always hear that old saying: "It's a small world." Yeah. Where were you? You were born in Rome, though, wasn't you? I was born at home. You were born at home? Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> well, actually, actually, you say that, and I was born in Indiana at uh, Mishawaka Hospital, which Mishawaka, Indiana is like uh, Forest Park would be to Atlanta. Mishawaka was to South Bend, Indiana. They were like right next to each other. But anyway, uh, every time I hear people say I don't go all the way to the top, I was actually born in the elevator on the way up to the maternity <laughs> ward. My mom told that story all the time, you know, oh, and and I, I I thought she was just saying that, you know, at first. Turns out it was true that uh, I was born in the elevator. So, well, that explains why I don't go all the way to the top floor, you know, anyway, but um, on that part. I was born in Crawford, Mom. Were you? Yeah. Well, that was, there was only about two hospitals back then, wasn't there? Emory and Crawford Long? Maybe there's a third one. I can't remember Georgia Baptist. I don't think Georgia Baptist had gone back that far. But does, like it, it does anyone know why it was called or named after after it's Crawford Long? After Mr. Crawford Long? He's the guy that invented, invented anesthesia. And he's, now they've got, uh, well, they did have, it's been years since I've been up there or been in that hospital, but. Uh, they had a, as you went in in the lobby part of it, they had a little uh, museum kind of thing uh, for him. Oh, did they? For him, right there. If you, you know, if you walk in, you oh, yeah. just stand there and look around. Yeah. That's uh, part of Emory or something now, or Piedmont, isn't it? What? Yeah, they, they, they Emory comes out the up front side, and they build right out there. And then they've taken yeah. all, everything over. Yeah. Yeah. Still use the same parking lot and cross. You can go through that itself. All right, do we have any other uh, people on our prayer list that we need to talk about? Uh, yes. I'd like to add my cousin. His name is Blake Pittman. He's 43. He lives in South Georgia, but he's in Emory now. He, uh, he has a lot of heart problems. His heart was working at less than 10%. He's been, they've had him sedated and out since last weekend. Uh, they put a pump in his heart or somewhere in his vein to pump his heart to keep him alive. And, and if, in a few days, if things go well, they'll go in and put an L bad or some kind of something in to work for him. Anyway, he needs a heart transplant. He's a... Uh, oh. What's his name again? His name again, yes. Blake Pittman. Blake Pittman. Yeah. Okay. And how old did you say he was? How old is he? He's 43. 43. Wow. Young. <laughs> Young, really. I, my son that fell through the ceiling and fell 20 feet um, was scheduled to get the first operation on the left foot, the one that um, had... Uh, was split open and the swelling had not gone down enough. So they couldn't do it, so they put it off until the end of February and so he's still completely immobile. He's learned to maneuver and he said at least he could go to the bathroom now by himself. So that was a big deal. But um, they had planned to go to Colorado with um, some of uh, his wife Diane's family, and they do this every year. They've got a condo out there, and they have these big plans made for. Of course, Mark can't go, but he wants Diane to go on. So the plan is right now that my other two sons, on either one older, one younger than him, the two two brothers are going to go up there and the three of them will be there together for a week, just them. Now, 
I'm not sure which one we should pray for. <laughs> <laughs> They are, they are going to have some times, I can uh, assure you, and remember some of the things they all got into <laughs> that fortunately I don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, I think it's a wonderful idea. Mm -hmm. I am tickled to death because the three of them are, are very different personalities. So there has been, you know, crosswires at times and I think that in their old age right, <laughs> that they will find some real precious time with, with this stuff and I think it's wonderful. I'm yeah. tickled to death that's going to happen. Yeah, I think but anytime Mark, siblings Mark, get together. Mark has to be sure that he can <coughs> this. He's got, he's got to get up out of that bed. <laughs> I think anytime siblings can get together, it's really great. It's, it, you know, it keeps that well, family it bond just, together. It'll just be a guy's week, and I think it's a wonderful idea. Yep. We're very, very fortunate to have our, our children with us to us, except for one. Yeah. She comes all the time to see us and calls. And um, they have decided since we're getting older that they're going to cook for us every week. <laughs> so one of two have us one week, and then the other one they do it the next week. Or they're going to pay for us to go. We went to see the chosen that's coming up the next four seats. Did we see three or four? Three. Three. Uh, that's coming up. Um, Season four. Season four. We Season watched four. episode one, two, and three we at the theater. About, and we spent about three hours, over three hours. It was really unbelievable. So we can't wait for when we get it again, to be able to show it. Yeah, that's good. It is good. Okay. Okay, anybody else we need to talk about on our prayer list and stuff? I mean, it's a full list of people and everything. So. I, I, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, just remember my cousin, Dora, that the cancer has got into her bone marrow now. So. Yeah. It usually spreads pretty fast when that happens. Well, she, yeah, but she's been dealing with it for over 10 years. It started in her colon, and now it's made it to, so she does start treatment for that. That's so. pretty miraculous, because usually when it gets in the colon, it don't last long. If she's got 10 years, oh, yeah. that's really under, under mm -hmm. I'm growing a beard that's getting itchy. <laughs> she, anyway. Yeah, she's, she's uh, been fighting it for a good 10 years. Wow. David, you were going to say something? Yes, I'd like to. Uh, I talked to Carrie. And she, we call her our daughter, but she's actually Jean's great niece. And she calls me every day about 4 o'clock. She works downtown, and, and at, lots of times she'll talk to me on the on the dash phone uh, coming home. <coughs> she always checks on me. We prayed yet. I put her, asked y'all to pray for her a couple of weeks back, and I had a discussion with her. Told her I just want you to know you're on high prayer list. There's lots of saints praying for you out there. <coughs> that impressed her. She and, and uh, she's mentioned it two or three times. And I said, well, it's a blessing. And she's doing a lot better. And, and she <coughs> mentioned, she says, I can tell somebody's praying for me. Now. We have a good conversation for a little while. Sometimes she's on the way to the grocery store and all, but she's doing a lot better. And I, I want to thank y'all for the prayers. And, and remember, because she's got her hands full uh, with a, a full job and a husband and things like that. But she's she's a champion, and she she appreciates it. Yeah. So be sure to thank God, because he's the one to pull the trigger. I had, uh, and you've probably heard me talk in the past about it, had a friend, R.K., before he passed, that came here every race weekend, and we'd go to the race, we did it for like 30 years, had same seats in the track all the time. But anyway, <clears throat> he passed back in 13. And it's real easy to remember when he passed because it was the 11th month, 12th day, 13th year. And uh, when he passed. But anyway, uh, his his widow, I, I communicate with her, Glenn and I do, Nancy, uh, quite a bit. And she's found out that her sons, 
she also lost her daughter. They only had a boy and a girl. They lost her daughter by an accident. She fell and hit her head on the end of a coffee table and got a hemorrhage up there and, and she passed from that. But anyway, about a year and a half after RK died. And so she's got a son now. And now he's got some kind of a rare bone disease that eaten away at his hip. So they're probably going to do a hip surgery on him. I asked her if replacing it is what they've got in mind. And she said, well, they're not totally sure yet if it'll work. But anyway, it's, uh, and I forget the name of it. It's one of them, you know, one's got a name about that long. So it's easier to just say a hip problem. But anyway, it, uh, it's deteriorating his hip bone and uh, or his socket right there and uh, on it. So anyway, we're going to keep him in his... His, in our prayers, Nancy's son, so, uh, Jason's his name, Jason Moore, so, anyway, all right, anyone else we need to add to it? David, you want to pray for these on our prayer list for us, yes, sir? sir? I want to say something uh, before I pray. You notice it's quiet in here. The air is not blowing. Amen. It's, it's, I feel like it's, Hallelujah. it's, it's a few degrees warmer. I talked to Buddy Lane, their son, me and I and Buddy just went back. And he said, I look at it, I talked to him last Sunday. He came to me this morning. And the reason it's warmer in here is the thermostat out there at that time he went to it, approached it, was set on 68 degrees. He's, he's elevated the temperature. And he said, and the other thing is, uh, because there's there's not a, uh, additional heat in this room or a, a backup heat element, they they uh, usually leave the fan running all the time. But that's what that was our downfall. With the fan continually running, it just wipes us out and it gets warm in there. So he set the thermostat up. He turned the turn, switched the fan position. He said, if it happens again, if it happens again, he said, you know where the thermostat is in the hall out there. He said, just let me know and I'll set it back. So I, I wanted to, I want to let y'all know what Buddy did for us. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Well, it feels plenty warm to me, but anyway. <laughs> All right, you want to pray for these on our prayer list? Yes, I do. Gracious Heavenly Father, humbly we come to you. You are our one and only law of the Lord the great I am. I'm humbled that you, because of Jesus, we can talk to you in his name. Father, bless these people that we speak about here and the people that ask for these prayers, for their families or friends and things like that, and they all mean so much to us, and we know they mean, they mean the most to you. Please heal them, Lord, if it's thy will. Help them along through the things that they need for, to recover and keep them safe for us and help us to stay in your word. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, our lesson today is in Genesis chapter 12, and it's the, uh, the call to Abram. Uh, in verse 1, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred, and your father's house and the land that I will show you. Two, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be blessed. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, I, I was thinking about this earlier when I was thinking about it, and Betty popped in my mind, you know, when her and her husband decided to up and move to Australia. I can't, I mean, I know how scary it was for me when I decided to move from Indiana down here to Georgia. Uh, I, I left my job. I had a good job up there. I uh, was a payroll accountant for a construction company. We were building a dam on the Ohio River and uh and security and stuff and you have to have to kind of take into consideration in my case uh 
I was raised in a children's home, which all of you know, and I was there 10 years. Well, you know, we, it's routine. It was basically, if you'd ever been in the military or know much about the military, it's the same thing. It was very rigid, routine. You did everything by the, by the clock and by the book and stuff. So it was very rigid. And then, uh, but to, to have a lifestyle like that, and then all of a sudden I'm going to give all that up and move to Georgia. You know, and I, I decided I wanted to come to Georgia. I wanted to go to work for Delta Airlines. And I had a, a foster sister that, that her husband worked for Delta and heard about all this great stuff about flying and all that. And uh, so I, I came down here on, on just faith and never did get an interview with Delta. I got one with Southern Airlines and that, I knew that wasn't getting that job because that guy said, oh, another good yank. So, okay. So that, and I got one with Eastern Airlines, got one with United, and it just so happened that, that United called me a day before Easter did. But anyway, long story short, that's how I came down to Georgia. But it was a really scary, nerve-wracking time in my life at that point, up, just up, giving up everything, everybody I knew, everybody I was around and everything, and come to an area that I was not familiar with. And I was thinking about Betty on that. I mean, she gave up her country to move to an entirely different country. Now, luckily, they spoke some English over there. You know, uh, <laughs> you, you, you kind of have to, have to learn the, uh, the lyrics. We were talking about that last week. That, difference between the English language uh, in England and the English language in the U.S. But to pick up your entire family and everything you have and move to some place that you know you're going to be for an extended period of time, I would have had to have thought that was really a little scary and putting a lot of faith in, in your husband or, uh, and I assume he was the PowerPoint behind doing that. And, uh, to put, put the faith in there and just lift up all your kids and do it. I don't think I could do it. But then again, it boils down to, in here in, in, in uh, chapter 12, is God calling you to do this or is this something you're thinking about doing on your own? If God calls you to do it, He's going to protect you. You might not think so sometimes, but He's going to protect you. But in Abraham's case, he called him to go, number one, to a place he really wasn't sure of that he was going to. He had a Canaan, but I mean, you got to also remember in that period of time, Abraham was pretty pretty rich. You know, had, he had an excellent living standard as compared to other people in that era of time and to pack up everything. But he was not only moving his, his family, but his entire clan there and all of his animals and stuff, he was moving everything. Well, back then, if you, if you can kind of go on the map and route out the way he would have had to go on, he couldn't take the shortcut, which is right through the desert. Animals wouldn't survive it. He would have to kind of go out and around and all that and, and just kind of looking at it, researching a little bit. We're talking probably the route he would have to take be about a thousand miles. Now, Visualize a thousand miles would be about from Indianapolis, Indiana, which is in the middle of the state, to Orlando, Florida. That'd be about a thousand miles. <clears throat> Number one, you're going to walk it. Uh, so they don't really know how long it would take him to do that, but some of the some of the estimates that I've kind of read is probably a year in order for him to be able to travel that far. Uh, but to take your whole clan and move an entire entire family uh, just on, on the faith. But God did promise Abraham to give him a land which would be the land of the Canaan, to make Abraham into a great nation, to bless Abram, to make him a man of renown, but doing Abram what the people in the plains of, and I think it's Shisar, wanted to do for themselves. And he promised also to bless those who bless him and curse those who mistreated him. Now, personally, I'd hate to be on that last one. That was in verse 12, 3. I'd hate to be on that last group right there. But anyway, Abraham did all this under faith. And 
it would be, it'd be <laughs> to me, it would be kind of hard to determine. You know, I'd be, I'm, I'm the type of person that questions a lot of things. I'd be saying, are you sure, Lord, you want me to do this? Am I misunderstanding what you're saying? Or did I misinterpret that or something like that? I would have a tendency to do that. Uh, so anyway, verse 4 there. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed. 75 years old. That would be five years ago for me. I can't imagine 75 walking a thousand miles making a trip like that. Um, it's good they had God left put some, some laundromats along the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> true um, anyway verse 5 and Abram took Sarah his wife and Lot his brother's son and all the possessions that they had gathered and the people they had acquired in Haram Harm or how you pronounce that and they set out to go to the land of Canaan when they came to the land of Canaan uh, now remember when he set out to do it and he traveled it, we're talking about a long period of time there. Don't really know how long, but I'm I'm figuring it took at least a year, what well, I'm estimating. Next, in 6, Abram passed through the land of a place at Shariam to the oak. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to you, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he moved to the hill country to the east with Bethlehem and pitched his tent with Bethlehem in his west and Ali, Ali, Ai, how you pronounce it, Ai, to the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon his name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going towards Dick Buck. Now, he's traveling all this time, and it's, you know, it's, it's kind of scary. Betty, in your case, when you traveled over to Australia, did you know exactly where you were going? And yes. You knew yes. exactly where you are going? Jobs. Oh, you already had jobs over there? Okay. And we knew someone was needing us, so it wasn't totally out of the Wasn't all planned out, but you just basically like Abram, you said this is where you're going and this is where you're going to be, right. but not sure exactly what part of that. That's right. Hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, think about it, you know, in your, in your lives, is there ever times when you thought, you know, God's telling me I need to do this. I think about this a lot of times with pastors. You know, you'll hear examples where pastors will go to go uh, be called to a church, and you're not only totally sure, you know, if you're supposed to be called or not. I've often wondered, you know, what makes them feel they were called? Is it a yearning for it? Is it something that they need to to uh, pray a lot about. I remember Buddy Prestrope when he was talking about coming here he uh, coming to visit and had a flat tire and had to change the tire out on his car and then it wasn't very long after that they had a second flat tire. Now that would I would have taken that as wait a minute I think maybe the Lord is trying to tell me maybe I shouldn't go there or something but it, it, that didn't discourage him thank goodness and stuff and he he wound up, uh, I think, having like four flat tires before it was over with, and uh, on it. But it, all of them weren't coming here. It was, you know, later on the other two went. But I would, I would have taken that as well. Maybe the Lord's trying to tell me not to go there or something. So the hard part to me, it might not be to you, but the hard part to me is determining if God is speaking to me. Or if I'm thinking because I want something that God is speaking to me. 
I mean, you know, like I told my wife several times, I said, you know, I think God really wants me to have an over and under shotgun. You know, I, I, I mean, he just keeps pushing them because every time I turn around, there's one on sale or something, you know. I said, that, you know, I, I, I think it's happened. Now, I will tell you, and I may have already told you this story before, I will tell you, we have a 65-inch TV, and God wanted me to have that TV. And I can prove that by the fact that our friend Brenda, a few of you know her before she passed, but anyway, she had gone to an assisted living place, and she had a 65-inch TV. Well, if most of these assisted living places, her whole room wasn't probably as big as this place, bedroom and all. So she's about as close as me to those chairs from her TV, a 65-inch. So I was over one day, and I told her, and she knew I'd been looking for one. I was looking at them on sale and stuff. And she said, I'll tell you what. She said, is that a 50-inch you got? I said, yeah, it's 50-inch we got. She said, I'll swap TVs with you because this is too big, which it was for that close. And she said, I'll swap TVs with you. You'll give me that 50-inch. Hey, that's exactly, that solved my problem. I was wanting a bigger one because ours is way off. And... Uh, so anyway, I swapped TVs with her. Well, a week after I swapped TVs with her, we had an electrical storm. And that electrical storm took out that free TV that I got. It took out my, my uh, cable box. It took out my modem and stuff. So anyway, uh, I got, got the modem replaced and got the cable box. The company sent me a new one on that dish did. Anyway, but now I'm back down to a smaller TV, the one we had in the bedroom there back in here. <clears throat> so anyway. You got rabbit ears? Uh, almost. almost. Anyway, so we wound up, uh, I, I went to the men's breakfast on Monday morning. And Glenda called me on the, when I was getting ready to leave, wanted me to go by Walmart and pick up a couple things. Now, number one, I hate going to Walmart. And naturally, she wanted me to pick up two things. One of them's a grocery, which is on this end of the store, and the other's on the other end of the store. <clears throat> so I picked up the one item. I'm going down to the line, heading towards the electronic, going up that big aisle down through there. And right there in the middle of the aisle, they had two, only two left, 65-inch Olden TV, which is the Walmart brand, marked down from $568 to $299. And I said, God wants me to have that. Because he sent me right by that TV. <clears throat> well, it was too big to go in my car, so I slid over and paid for it. And I said, I've come back to my truck and get it. So I've always said that because that was on sale, it was right in my path. I had to actually go around it to, to do it. That God wanted me to have that TV to replace the one that was free. So, you know, that was a kind of a given to me on that one there. But I've actually had problems through the years of really knowing when God wants me to do something. I mean, I think he puts it on my conscience to do things and enough that I can't get it off of my mind until either I do or don't and stuff. But some people have no problem. Like I was talking earlier about Buddy Pastrope, he went through all that, came here and... Uh, the one thing I admired about Buddy, before he even talked about money or anything, he said, well, let me pray about it. Whether, and he took the job not knowing what the salary would be for that job. And uh, I thought, well, that was, that was faith, actually, on that. That's a beautiful key right there. When, when you're wondering about that, God's right there with you. And you got to pray about it. And, and if you don't get an answer, just keep praying. So true. That's so true. And I've seen things that way that I they, they come up in my life, and I, I don't know if I want to do that or not. And is he telling me that? And and do it. You really, really need to get prayer about it, man. And if you're putting it on your conscience, he's putting it on your conscience too. So just think deeper about it. That's, you got to do that because he's with us, you know. Yeah, and so. You know, I, I learned over the years that my conscience is a lot of times God speaking to me to do things. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've never always followed them, and it always comes back to bite me. 
You know, there's a couple things in life, too. I've always said <clears throat> that I'm the head of my household, and my wife would tell you that, but she's also the neck that turns the head. And there's been several times in our life where I would, I think, well, I need to do so-and-so, and I didn't really have God pushing me to do this, but Glenda, with the wisdom that she has, a lot of times would say, you don't really need to do that. Now, she never said, don't do it, but she would always say, you know, you need to really think about it. You need to pray about that, whether to do that or not, you know. Well, the thing about praying is if you really want something, you have a tendency sometimes to pray the wrong way. And I've always said that God God answers prayers. Some, some prayers he says yes to, some prayers he says no to, and some prayers he says you got to be kidding. But anyway, and a lot of times that falls under mine. But anyway, uh, but if, a lot of times when I didn't listen to her advice and I went ahead and did it anyway, the old saying, it comes back and bites you. Well, that happened to me, you know. So I, I, can, I can halfway see Ab Abram's thing here where he's listening to God to do this. And I was really be curious to know what the other family members thought about it. Now, back in that era... When the man spoke, everybody else did, you know, kids, family, wives, everything, did what he said to do. And uh, it wasn't, you know, so much like it is in today's world. In it, But I think God puts things in our path to guide us that we're doing what he wants us to do. And I think he puts things in our path to say, this is not what I had in mind for you. And uh, a lot of times the wisdom of a wife can be that uh, on that. But anyway, I can't imagine Abram uh, going through a lot of what he went through, the journey and stuff he went through on all that. Um, anyway, um, now they went down into Egypt for a little while uh, and stayed there a while. Now there was a phantom in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to, to journey there, and a famine was severe in the land. We're in verse 11 now. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarah, his wife, I know that you are a woman of beauty and appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is, your, the, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. So she must have had some magnificent beauty, if that's the case. And of course, we all know from the story going on and everything that, that uh, he said it was his sister and and Pharaoh took her as a wife and stuff and then found out later that it was his wife and and all that but um, anyway it uh, I can't imagine you know you're not saying yes this is my wife but he was fearful of his life now here's a man that listened to God was doing what God told him everything but yet at this point in time in his life he didn't think God was going to protect him so he made up a story about his wife on that. Uh, anyway, on, on 14 there, when Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw the woman that was very beautiful. Uh, and when the prince of the Pharaoh saw her, uh, they praised her uh, to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to the Pharaoh's house. So back then, the Egyptian Pharaoh, he just, if he saw some, somebody like, he took them. Now their custom was if the woman was married, they wouldn't do that. And that's why so many times uh, they would actually uh, have the husband killed or something. So now she's a free woman again. Uh, remember uh, David did that when he saw the woman across the road there. And he put his uh, main army general out in front of the troops so he knew he wouldn't survive. Uh, Anyway, he wound up, uh, the Pharaoh uh, gave the men orders concerning him, but they said to him, away with his wife and all that he had. This is back in verse 20 now. I kind of got a little bit ahead right there. I need to back up to 18. So the Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that you have done to me? Why did you tell me that this was, why did you tell me that this was your wife? Why did you say this is my sister? So I took her as my wife. Now then, here's your wife. Take her and go. 
So anyway, they're uh, they're having to depart Egypt at this point in time here. Uh, how long they were in Egypt? I don't I don't have no clue. I don't really know. I know there was a famine going on, and uh, it was it was big must back then on all that. But the whole lesson here is basically if God directs you to do something, are you willing to take on faith and do it? And sometimes that's hard to answer in my case. And most people immediately say, no, if God directs me to do it, I'll do it. The question is, are you sure it's God telling you to do it? You know, uh, our own personal desires or Satan's desires for us sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, will take over and, uh, and instead of uh, us doing it, we're, we're wanting to believe what we want to believe and not so much believe what God's driving us or directing us to believe. Any comments? Questions? I know I have that same problem. <clears throat> I have it a lot. I do. No questions? I must have been a little confusing then if I have no questions. <laughs> I think I read somewhere but she was actually his half sister. She was what? His half sister. <clears throat> even though she was his wife. Or was I reading that about someone else? I don't know. I've never read that. I mean it could be true, but I had I hadn't read that on on there. <clears throat> when I started this the thing on the phone is like the and the book I've been reading is like the Chronicle Bible. You read a chapter every day. Yeah. And I was thinking when when it came to that, it started out in Genesis and stuff. And I thought where I read in that that she was actually his half sister. But it might have been someone else I was reading it about. So. I don't. I don't know. I'm not familiar with that. Joe might know the answer to that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, can anybody share with us a time in their life when uh, they had to just up and move and had really no idea of what they were doing or everything? I know we mentioned Betty earlier going to Australia, and uh, I would find that a little nerving myself. And But there again, you know, I, I think the way a person is raised has a lot of influence or bearing on them. Um, I can't imagine somebody raised in the south in this area their whole life being here and then uprooting and taking off to go to some place you're not familiar with. Of course, Australia wouldn't be as bad as if you went to the Middle East or some place like that where, they, number one, they didn't speak English, or in this case here, they didn't speak Southern. Uh, uh, but, but I think, uh, you know, on that, but I know in my upbringing, and I mentioned earlier the way I was raised and stuff, everything was rigid. Uh, that's why a lot of the, the boys in the home I was in went right into the military. They were used to that life. When I got drafted and went into the military, I mean, I just fell right in. That was no big deal. It's the same lifestyle I'd had for a long time. Uh, even though I'd been out for almost seven years, uh, I had no problem adjusting to it whatsoever. And a lot of guys did. But to be uprooted like that uh, the scariest probably moment I had really was when I quit a good job I had and I turned in a two-week notice and and I came down here and the, the project manager on the job tried to talk me out of it and I told him I said you know I hired, when I hired on I told you my my goal was to go to work for an airline I said if I feel if I don't do that then you know I'll be missing out and uh, he told me he said well if it don't work out, you got a job here. So anyway, that was good to know that I had that to fall back on. But to uproot and just come down here. Now, if I hadn't have done that, I wouldn't have met my current wife. And if I hadn't have done that, my present wife wouldn't have met her future husband. So she, anyway, long story short, that's a different story. I was working with the So then I had to call him to let him know I had the wheel down there. 
by the time I came to Will, I knew all about it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was how. I made a will out because I got drafted and I wanted to make a will out before I, <laughs> I, I left. Vietnam was real big back then. When, and when you got drafted, the military doesn't train draftees for anything because they're only in there two years. And if you've already got a trade, they'll put you in that trade like they did in David's case, you know. Uh, and they did in my case because I was in the band. And uh, But mostly you got drafted, you went through basic, and then they sent you to AIT, which is Advanced Infantry Training, and then they sent you over to NOM. And you were in the infantry over there. Uh, if you were in for a longer period of time, then they would train you in some Pacific field And uh, in that case. But uh, I look back over my life and I felt, you know, God got me to come here and stuff. But I look over my life, how everything God has put everything in my life, and it's it's just all fell right in place, you know. Uh, I was devastated when when my wife's uh, first wife said, you know, that uh, she found somebody else. And I mean, it knocked me flat. I didn't even know we had a problem. And uh, but I guess I was oblivious to that part of it. And she was raised in the same home I was raised in. So you know, we knew each other from high school, all through high school and stuff. And uh, but anyway, long story short, uh, we'd gotten divorced. And of course, we got divorced, and right after I got divorced, the military knew I was divorced now, and uh, so I got back to drafted in 1A and got called into into the service, uh, drafted into the service. And I had met Glenda. I was out on a maybe I need to maybe not tell this, but anyway, I will. <clears throat> I was on a date with the ex-wife of the guy that my first wife had hooked up with and it was one of those things she wanted she wanted to know about Bert and I wanted to know about him because we had Bert and I had Bethany and, and she had custody of Bethany and I wanted to know what kind of guy was you know taking taking charge of my uh, my daughter here and uh, so we were on a date and she, uh, and this really not have anything to do with this lesson except for faith in God. <laughs> but she goes, she goes, had, had to go to the restroom and she comes back out of the bathroom. And we were up at the Scott Hudson building, which back then, there wasn't any real nice restaurants on the south side of Atlanta out of, out of Fulton County. That was the nicest restaurant they had up there. So she goes up there and she comes back out and here's Glenda with her. And she said, I ran into her in the bathroom in there. And Glenda was out looking for her husband, which she was pretty sure was running around on her. And it turns out later was she was correct. So anyway, that's how I met Glenda. And I happen to remember that she worked for a lawyer. And I happen to remember her telling me where, you know, they looked there in Jonesboro at the, above the bank. And so when I got drafted inside and I needed a will, which was a couple months later, uh, I... Uh, wound up uh, going to that office and said, hey, I need to make an appointment to get a will made. And I walked in, and Glenn's got a great memory on names and stuff and everything. I, could, I couldn't have told you her name if you'd have asked me ten times, you know. So I did my usual thing. I covered for myself. I said, hey, Angel, how you doing? Well, she just melted when I said Angel. And I only said Angel because I couldn't remember what her name was. And uh, so anyway, we wound up we wound up, you know, I found out by this time that she was divorced, and I had been divorced about a month after I'd met her that first time. And uh, so anyway, I, I asked people and said, well, I'm, I met my wife in a bar, and uh, because Scott Hutchinson back then served drinks. And I didn't drink, and, but unfortunately the gal I was with did. And uh, I found out how expensive drinking could be. But anyway, uh, long story short, uh, we started talking on the phone and stuff, and the whole time we talked on the phone off and on for a month and I'm waiting on her to say her name and finally one day she said and Ruby said Glenda you ought to do this boy I wrote that down real quick <laughs> so anyway I wound up calling her Angel for years until our granddaughter was born Kim's first child and she called her Angel and then I found out when she was about two I couldn't say Angel because they both turned around and say yes and so I went back calling her Glenda but uh, anyway that's that's how we met but I was 
I started all this whole story to tell you basically I think God puts things in your path and he did that he he put the situation there where I would meet her my future wife and he, he, he put a godly woman in my path which I never had that before in the home we went to church we had church every Sunday at at uh, two o'clock in the afternoon the pastor would come from another church there uh, and he would come to our church at two o'clock so we had church every Sunday at two o'clock and uh, then after that we'd go it was a non-denominational church uh, we called it chapel we had chapel and uh, beautiful building I need to show you pictures of it sometime it was built in 1895 it's got two stained glass windows one on this side it depicts a soldier and one on that side a sailor and these windows are like 12 feet wide, 20 feet tall. And when they refurbished the building in 1995 at its 100th year anniversary, those windows were valued at a million dollars. The stained glass windows are beautiful. I got pictures of them. Uh, but anyway, uh, that really has nothing to do with any of this. But anyway, that uh, on doing all that, uh, we went to church and everything, but we weren't allowed... The pastor wasn't allowed to call you, you know, offer you to come down front, you know, to, to be saved or anything like that. And uh, so we never had that opportunity to go on. He wasn't allowed to do that. But we had, he got sick one day. And so we had a fill-in preacher that came. And that pastor, and I was about 12, 13 years old. I actually got, still have the pamphlet, the church bulletin I have, and I had written in it. So it was in 1956, so I'd be 12 years old. So 1956, I wrote the date in there, I repent. Anyway, he uh, he said, uh, I can't call you down front, but he said, just close your eyes if you believe in, in you know, in God and all that, and, and ask for your salvation. He said, you know, I'll, I'll pray for you. Well, he did that, and that's when I did, and he was never invited back. Uh, to the church but anyway uh, that was basically our chapel life we went to church we had chapel and stuff non-denominational uh, except Fridays Fridays it, it we always had fish on Fridays and that was for what Catholic students we had now and when the Pope came out I don't know around 57 somewhere in there and said you don't have to eat fish anymore on Friday and I was so thrilled because I kept thinking, all right, we're not going to have fish because I, I can't stand fish. I can't stand to smell it. Anyway, I uh, like, used to like catching it, but I just never would eat any fish. Anyway, long story short, we still got fish every Friday, all the way up till I graduated. But uh, when, I was in the, wait a minute, when I was in the home, we never knew. I, like, I wouldn't know if this kid was Baptist and this was Jewish or this was... Catholic or what you we never knew what each other's religion was I never even heard of Baptist till I went to southern Indiana with Chet and Sally which used to be house parents that God put in my path at the right time in my life he put them in my path and uh, they went to a Baptist church that's the first time I ever heard of Baptist I don't know anything about Baptist <coughs> anyway yes dear Oh. Anyway, but anyway, uh, so what I was getting at, this whole story, this whole rambling about all this, is the fact that God directs you to do something, you know, he's going to put the things in your path to do it. I believe to this day now that God directed me to come south, to come to Georgia, you know. Even though at first, after I'd been down here a year and my, my marriage went to pot and stuff, I, I, I was devastated and stuff you know and I went through periods of you know why, why are you doing this to me you know and what is it you know what have I done wrong and, and blaming myself and stuff and I realized later on uh, there's an old saying it takes two to have an argument or something my wife and I never argued we never we never argued or anything so I couldn't I couldn't fathom what I had done wrong and I thought God was punishing me for something but it turns out to be a blessing in, in disguise in the long run her family and mine combined together. I wound up getting custody of my child, and uh, her family and my family together. And I couldn't pray for three kids to be closer together than my daughter and her two daughters, you know, and stuff. So 
God has directed us and He puts things in our past to help us to understand that this is what He wants us to do or where He wants us to go. Even though at the time, you might be fighting, do I need to go here or that? So, anything? Anybody else got any comments or anything? I believe you're absolutely right about that. And uh, I, uh, I think that because you go through your life, people, lots of people's lives are just whirlwind, get up, we'll get this done and all that. It takes you a lot. I, I, when, when I lost you, it's been a couple of years now, I stopped thinking, why am I still around? But one good thing about being around is you have time, especially more time, to be quiet. And you should take that time to know that you're not alone, you're with God. And that's the time to think. And the things that you brought up there about God plans and the way that things worked out for you, you stop and think about through your life, and I've said this before, and I've said it in, in public too, that God is with you all the way, and he, he takes this chess piece and puts it right there. Uh, like he took Miss Cooper, my first grade teacher, and put it right there for me. I don't know if she was an angel or not, but she sure was an agent as an angel. And this all through your life, take the time to be over there, read a little bit of your Bible, pray a little bit, and be with Him, and say, "Tell me what's going on, Lord." And if I'll come back and I'll ask again. There's so many things through your life. If you have time to stop and think and look back, you say, "Well, that's why I went that direction." And I, I see that in your life too, man. You need to come to the story book, the story group telling across the street there. <laughs> it's true. It's true. You, you've got. You need to share that. Any other comments? Okay, David, you want to pray us out there? Oh, there. But oh, wait a minute before you do. It. Sorry. Yes. I wanted to ask the prayer. <clears throat> I've been praying for Michelle. So she's got a neck and back problem for the last two or three weeks. And it's not seeming to get much better. It is. It is getting better? Okay. Oh, no, I said it's been years. Oh, well. Yeah. You start yeah. complaining. <laughs> well, it's getting and I worse. Pray, but I want everybody to pray for her to get better. And I, I keep collapsing yeah. and blacking out and passing out and oh, weird stuff. Mm. They say at first they said it was many strokes, which is possible. I could be. Yeah. You've had more than one. Several. Several. Been in the hospital three they times. classify that as a trans ischemic attack. Yeah, TIE. Yeah. I've been in the hospital more than a couple times. Wow. But yeah. the good thing is, she has a birthday mom, so we need to sing to her. No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Says a birthday mom. All right. You gonna be twenty one. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you. One good thing about this class, one good thing about this class, we'll never embarrass you. No, uh, that's one thing about it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, we'll be sure and keep you on our prayer list on that too. Uh, so that they, you have deteriorating bones back there. Yeah, What's I the have problem? Deteriorating um, disc in my back and neck, but I, I was injured really bad years ago, and I guess it's catching up with me. So. Yeah, a lot of times, a lot of times you have injuries years later, and the result of that injuries come back on you. I got How's a Walter bone, doing? Yeah, I got a bone spur. Is that up or close to your neck? Or? Yeah, it's in my neck. It's my number four. It, it, it's got a sharp bone spur. They don't know. I mean, if I fall or anything too hard, who knows what could happen. Little well, Carrie is about 52 years old, and she's had three spinal operations. Mm -hmm. She had oh. a three-tier grit, uh, one, two, three, like a ladder in her lower back, and then something in the middle. And the last one, it's, been, it's only been about nine months since she had one in her neck. 
Mm-hmm. But she feels so good. They have really? to move, move your stuff because you go in there and feel that thing. Well, I've been scared to death to get cut on over the years. I've been. Yeah, but I, I might get to let her talk to you. She has done so good. Sorry about that. Not a problem. No, no, no. That's a problem. That's what we're here for. Prayer. That's what we are. Uh, as for Walter, he is. He's sleeping a lot, resting a lot. Um, he doesn't seem to be getting any better, but he's not getting any worse. It's just. How's his appetite? Mm, maybe one meal a day. He won't eat any of my junk. He used to eat junk. He don't eat junk huh. much. Mm. I cooked cupcakes yesterday and they're still there. Huh. <laughs> they would have been gone if he wasn't feeling bad. Yeah. Okay. Okay, David, you want to press out? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this meeting today and, the, and our brothers and sisters in Christ. Oh, we put prayer, put Michelle on on our prayer list now, and and we we've heard of her. <coughs> and we we feel for her, but we know you love her, and and we ask you to heal her, Lord, and uh, that it's only you can make her feel better. Her, we give her some prayer, uh, relief, and we appreciate you healing her, and we, you you can do it, Lord. Father, we ask you what you do with Walter too, and that help, help him to have a better day. And all those others that we mentioned and un- unmentioned today, hear our hearts and know that we pray for this world and we pray for Israel and we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ and we pray to love our enemies that they might turn to, to you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.